Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We're very excited about this presentation. My name is Gene Beebe. I'm the area manager for the South Region of Vector Controls. Uh, we have with us today Gabe. Gabe is uh, hello, head, hello. is a, a a Navy vet, so we appreciate his service from that standpoint. Uh, has spent uh, since 2001 in the ultrasonic industry. Uh, he's been with uh, other competitors, and then recently, since 2017, with SIC. He's got a vast uh, array of knowledge in applications as well as technology packages. We're super excited to have Gabe give this presentation and then we're gonna turn it over. Thank you, Gabe. All right, thanks, Gene. Uh, so today we're gonna to talk about uh, six flow meters for ultrasonic flare applications and why we can do these difficult flare applications and uh, better than the competitors. So some flare challenges, what are we dealing with? These are all technologies, turn down ratio, meeting state guidelines, meeting federal guidelines, constantly changing compositions. These are all traditional challenges of any technology that we're gonna have issues with. Atmospheric pressures, right? A flare line is a open-ended pipe with the flame on top of it. So it's dealing with no pressure in the line. In some cases, vapor recovery system. So you have a slight vacuum in the line, right? Corrosive environments. We have all kinds of different gases some have liquids, some carry solids, right? Uh, corrosive hydrogen sulfide, hydrogen fluoride, all kinds of different things going through the line that can cause damage to the sensors and equipment. And I want to show you why our sensors can uh, handle a great deal of that. And then the main reason uh, is turndown ratio. You know, flares operate from 0.1 feet per second to 400 feet per second, according to the RSR. Okay, so we can handle those wide ranges of, of flow capabilities. We have two algorithms that I'll show you that can handle a low flow situation and a high flow situation. So these are the challenges that are involved and what we call the SICK innovation. That's how we meet these challenges. So this, the design of our sensor is the first one that we're going to go over. How we design our sensor is completely different from the traditional design. So a traditional design you have a piezoelectric device that's attached to a matching layer. So using the piezoelectric effect, this, the device is hit with the, with the signal. The piezoelectric crystal then vibrates and produces this ultrasonic sound wave, goes through the matching layer and into the fluid, okay? That's the traditional design of an ultrasonic flow sensor. What we do differently, what we call bolt technology. So we have a piezo ring that's attached to a bolt inside a resonator. When the piezo ring is then hit with the, with the voltage to vibrate it, it vibrates this whole bolt inside the resonator. This hugely amplifies the acoustic signal coming out uh, of the sensor. In addition, that resonator is completely detached from the housing that the sensor is in. So this, what this does is focus our ultrasonic signal completely out the front of the sensor. If you see here, these sensors are completely attached from the resonator housing, okay? So what I like to, uh, analogy I like to use is our, our ultrasonic uh, sensor is more like a laser and traditional design is more like a flashlight, okay? So you're gonna get a better focused ultrasonic signal coming out of our sensor. So that's one aspect of the SICK innovation is the sensor design. Uh, our sensors have, are, are, are great, to be honest with you. They have, have a mean time between failures of 15.4 years. So it's the last time that we've had an actual sensor fail due to design. Okay, all of the sensors are metal, made from metal. There is no matching layer. So this in, hugely increases the uh, acoustic efficiency of our sensor versus the traditional design. Okay, on the low flow and high flow side, how do we, so we have this sensor that uh, produces this great ultrasonic signal. We then apply that signal to two algorithms. We've got a special two-stage signal algorithm, one for low flow and one for high flow. They differentiate around 230 feet per second. So uh, the Hilbert algorithm, which is taken directly from our Flow 6600 custody transfer flow meter, is what we used in the low flow application. So what this is, well, I'll, I'll explain uh, the Hilbert in just a second. The other uh, uh, algorithm is the cross-correlation algorithm, which is used for high flow measurement. In the low flow measurement, what we do is we take a look at the signal and we look at the third cycle to peak. 
on that signal. We don't look at the whole signal, just one particular cycle of that signal. So what we do is when we get to that third cycle, then along with the zero crossing algorithms, we optimize that, that sensor, uh, where that sensor is going to read that zero, that starting point or ending point if it's the received signal. Okay, so on the transmit side, when we start at that perfect spot there on that third cycle and end at that same spot on the received cycle. What that does is gives us a, a, a very accurate transit time. Okay, that's why we can make these meters read at really low flow rates of 0.1 to one foot per second, where most other uh, algorithms that are designed in other technologies can't get that far, in other ultrasonic technologies. So the practical resolution of this is less than 0.1, but we set the uh, meter usually up to 0.1 on up due to the RSR requirements. On the uh, high flow side, we have a triple cross correlation signal. So we send a medium low high burst signal. So now we're not looking at one cycle of the signal, but a triple burst of the signal, okay? When we say the same signature pattern cross, we stop the clock, that's the receive. So we transmit a triple burst and we wait for that triple burst to get received and then we stop it, okay? We don't have to be as accurate uh, on the high flow side to measure one particular cycle of a signal on the high flow side because uh, if you're looking at 0.5 feet per second on the low flow side and you're off by 0.1, 0.4, so that's 20% right there, right? So that would be 20% off in accuracy. But if you're only off by 0.1 at 299 feet per second versus 300 feet per second, that's not 0.1. That's very little difference. So you don't have to have that resolution in accuracy on the high flow side. We're waiting for the triple burst to go in. Also, you're going to have a lot more... Uh, problems with high flow, right? You're gonna have a lot of two-phase, solids or liquid particulate in the line, all kinds of different stuff, uh, uh, flow vortices and whatnot being caused in the line that is gonna make it harder to read one particular cycle of a signal. So those first two algorithms that I talked about are the way to calculate the transit times. In addition to those two algorithms, we also have a third algorithm that's made specifically for flare applications. Now this algorithm is not for the calculation of uh, velocity or the transit times to go, that go into the velocity calculation, but rather for mass flow and molecular weight. So in flare gas applications, uh, we have a, a hydrocarbon algorithm, what we call a hydrocarbon algorithm. So what this does is this uses an adiabatic gas coefficient internal to the MCUP, which is our flow computer that can calculate the molecular weight for hydrocarbons in a variety of gas compositions, okay? It's going to need an actual pressure, uh, actual temperature, and uh, sound speed, and uh, volumetric flow that go into these calculations to, in order to calculate the density, which then in turn is used to calculate mass flow and molecular weight, okay? So another one of the innovations, so those were the algorithms. Another one of the innovations is the installation angle that we use for our cross duct installations. Our cross duct installations are used at 75 degrees, okay? Where most uh, traditional ultrasonics are, are installed at 45 degrees. Why is this an issue? Why is this an innovation? Well, lower angles can cause signal drift past the flow sensor. So when you have a high flow rate, if you have a lower angle, you're gonna have a longer path length. Okay, this can cause the signal to drift past the receiving sensor before it has a chance to cross the, 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 the fluid, okay, the, the pipe size, depending on pipe size and whatnot. So that's one aspect of having a 75-degree uh, angle. We can use a 75-degree angle and a lower path length because of our algorithms that are used to calculate low flow. We can still be accurate without a longer path length that is required during a, a lower angle. In addition to that, when you have a lower angle, your sensors are more in, in, the, in the flow. So they're going to be causing disturbances at the face of the sensor on the receiving transmi uh, transmitter as well as the uh, transmitting sensor. So these cause disturbances on, on the face of the sensor as well. When you have a 75 degree angle, you have less of an angle to the face of the sensor, which would minimize these turbulences. Okay, both of these things can cause bad signal to noise ratio and distortion of the signal.
So in addition to the installation angle, another innovation, whoops, is the aerodynamic heads, okay? We have aerodynamic covers to the face of our sensors to minimize that distortion around the face of the sensor. What this does is make the sensor more aerodynamic and minimizes those distortions at the face. The probe version as well is an aerodynamic probe. We have five different versions of sensors, which I'll show you here shortly, but two of them are on the table right now. But they all have some sort of aerodynamic faces to them. Okay, so based on simulations and testing, we've determined that the optimal, the aerodynamic shapes and angles for minimal noise and flow disturbances. Okay, so that these are all reasons. All of these things increase to the signal and noise ratio, the sensor design, the algorithms, all of these uh, combined together to give us these uh, uh, sick innovation. So the sensors themselves, okay, uh, traditional designs had a lot of problems and high flows or ease of malfunction, bending, breaking, whatever, whatever, dropping them on closed valves, things like that could happen. Well, our rugged design is a full titanium sensor from, from the top to the bottom is full titanium. So, and it's a thick bulk metal. It's not going to break. It's been tested to 590 feet per second. Uh, wake frequency analysis before they actually start bending, okay? So that's not measuring flow rate up to 590 feet per second, but actual, the, the, the physical sensor itself not starting to bend or break until 590 feet per second, okay? Uh, if you see there, you see a picture of the EX90, the face of the sensor right there, which I was explaining to you earlier, is isolated from the housing that the sensor is, uh, that makes up the flow sensor. So the results, all of these things combined, the, the sensor design, the algorithms that are used to calculate flow, the algorithm that's used to calculate molecular weight and mass flow, the installation angle, and the housing, and the, and the aerodynamic shapes all um, uh, agree to make up a signal noise ratio of double of a traditional design. Reduces noise of about 50% and reduction of drift, drift effect of 30%. So this is the sick innovation. These are why we can make these hard applications, hydrogen, CO2 applications, we can do that. Those are traditionally, those, those gases are traditionally hard in, for ultrasonics to work in. We have uh, proven results in both gases that we can do these installations uh, with uh, little to no issues. So that's the sick difference right there. Optimum sensor design, specialized algorithms, aerodynamic heads, installation angle and rugged design. So the FlowSick 100 flare uh, family, we have two versions of sensors. We have a cross duct a type and a single sided type. Of these, we have three on the cross duct side based on primarily based on pipe size. Every flare will be evaluated for the right fit, okay? When we say that a, a, a tr the, these thumb rules of pipe size four to 18, 20 to 40 inch, 42 to 72 inch. Those are thumb rules. Every flare will be evaluated to ensure that the right sensor is going in. Some cases, well, you may have a high power in a 24 inch line, okay? And it's based on gas composition. Another thing is also the installation capability. You may go with the single sided installation. Okay, a single sided installation because you may have pipe runs on the other side of the pipe where you can't install a cross duct. In that case, we have the probe version and, the, and or the EX90 version. Both of them are capable from 12 to 72 inches, and both of them have uh, uh, strengths. On, on the probe side, it's one nozzle installation, one intrusion, both sensors on the same probe. The EX90 requires both uh, two sensors, but it also has capabilities in that it, you may already have the nozzle installations and valves already on your pipe, and you can plug and play, literally remove the old traditional design sensors and put the new install, uh, EX90s in there and, and be up and running within one day, okay? On the interface unit, we do have a new, a new interface unit that's coming out next year that has some uh, special uh, bells and whistles that uh, will be announced at that time, but it's not ready for, for deployment yet. The MCUP, the orange box, is the one that we're using right now with our five sets of uh, ultrasonic sensors. So that is the one that can do the mass flow, molecular weight, 
actual volumetric flow, standard volumetric flow, take in pressure and temperature inputs. There's, these are standard uh, two analog inputs per, per unit. Okay, we have the capability of doing five analog outputs uh, in the meter, Modbus communications, Ethernet communications are all uh, options that we can, that the customer can uh, purchase if they so desire. And um, that's really it. Uh, we have 2,300 units. One, one key thing is we really didn't start in flare applications until 2009. So just in the last 11 years, we're now 20% of the global market share in flare applications. So we're coming to the, uh, to the game late, but we are hitting the ground running and we're, we're catching on like wildfire. We have several customers right here that are listed on this page, but we're 2,300 and growing strong every day. And that's it. With that, we're good to go on questions. Many thanks for your attention. Thank you, Gabe. Uh, Nikki, do we have any, um, any questions that we could get started with? We do have some questions. Uh, so the, the first question, can the SICK meter be used in high H2 CO2 applications? Yes, yes. That's we, a very big problem around this. Oh, right, absolutely. That's a huge problem in flare applications and a lot of customers are turning to us for that very reason right there. So we have uh, good data showing us at de several different sites of 90% uh, hydrogen capability and sometimes in excess of 90% hydrogen capability. So we're having good uh, good uh, feedback from customers that that is the case and we're making those measurements. We have several different trials that started where they removed the traditional uh, bias 90 installation and put ours in there where theirs wasn't working and we just came in and started working right off the bat. So and both in both gases, CO2 and hydrogen. Hydrogen we have documented data of, of greater than 90% on the CO2 side we're, we're seeing uh, in excess of 60%. Now that doesn't mean it don't work any higher than 60%, we just, that's how high that particular application went. But that we measurement's difficult because we don't have the hydrogen carbon bond to, to fill off of, right? Right, so what happens there is that the sound wave gets diminished, it gets attenuated. It, can't, uh, it gets reflected by hydrogen and absorbed by CO2. Okay. So it just doesn't make the transmit from the, from, the, from the transmitted sensor to the receiving sensor. As effectively as right. regular hydrocarbon. Right. Nikki, okay, what's great. Uh, next question. Um, please discuss the local vector support and service. Okay, That's I'll you. take that one. Uh, so we have partnered with uh, with SICK. SICK had a great, uh, our relationship with SICK is, is about six months now. Uh, we're ramping up to that. We have a full service staff within this, the uh, vector organization. Uh, we do everything from uh, instrumentation to mechanical. And so this is going to add to that. We'll be able to do uh, calibrations, both of our products and of competitor products for the, the yearly calibrations that I think are required by, by the government. Mm -hmm. And um, we'll be supporting the, the, um, uh, the local SIC group as well with that. Okay, great. Next question. Does the SIC meter meet RSR requirements? Yes, yeah, so uh, uh, RSR refinery sector rule the requirements are from 0.1 to one foot per second, plus or minus 20%, and greater than one foot per second, plus or minus 5%. Okay, so every one, one key thing I'm gonna point out uh, preface is every flare application will be evaluated by our application engineers. Okay, it will be quantified. You will be giving a, a, a specific curve for your application. They take into account three different cases of gas compositions and give you a general accounting of what your meter will be able to do, what our meter will be able to do in your specific application. But yes, as a general thumb rule, the refinery sector rule uh, will be met in, in most applications. And if there's not one, we may have to go to a different version. That's why I was saying earlier, just because of these pipe sizes, that may not mean that we're gonna go with that particular sensor. We may have to go to a different sensor, a different angle of installation uh, or a different uh, package altogether to make your uh, app flare application meet the RSI requirements. So you don't have just one size fits all. No. So we can configure we have, based on the application. Absolutely. We have we have five different versions and we're going to use all five different versions based on that specific application. Good deal. Okay, great. How is the MW calculated in the SICK meter? 
so the molecular weight um, that is calculated internally to the in, inside the MCUP, which is the big orange box. So I, I touched on it a little bit. We have adiabatic gas coefficients that are uh, derived for hydrocarbons. Okay. So in addition to the the sound speed calculation, we have actual volumetric flow, pressure, and temperatures used to determine which coefficient is 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 picked. Internal to the meter, patented information it can derive these adiabatic gas coefficients. This coefficient is then applied to a density calculation, which is then applied to molecular weight. Which could be used in the RSR ruling as well. Yes, and we've, we've done testing on this. So as long as ideal gases are less than 10%, we are 1.8% off in, in mass flow and molecular weight calculations. Thank you. Which is extremely accurate compared to the competition. Absolutely. Okay, great, next question. Will the presence of condensing moisture during changing flare conditions cause a measurement problem? Yes, because we could have blowdowns of steam applications as well. How does that affect you? So we have those aerodynamic heads that uh, uh, minimize disturbances um, around the face of the sensor, and that helps us ha handle two-phase very well. In addition to that, you've got the 75-degree insulation angle. So we're very capable of handling two-phase applications in solids and liquids because of that. Okay, great. Next one. Uh, what is SNR and it's important to flare measurement? So SNR is signal to noise ratio. Um, what that is, is that's looking at the overall peak of the amplitude of the signal to the highest noise level. Okay, well, what this is, is it's a way for the sensor or for the meter, I should say, to differentiate between the background noise and the signal so it knows where to set the windows to receive the signal and also know where to start doing that third cycle for the algorithm to calculate flow. Okay, so the higher the signal to noise ratio, the better. And in and, and, uh, competition sensors, they, they don't follow signal to noise ratio, they use what's called signal strength, but it's basically the same thing. They don't look at a comparison or ratio of noise to signal, they just look at the strength of the signal. Okay, our signals to noise ratio is usually in the 50s and 60s times greater to the, to the noise where in other technologies, ultrasonic technologies is around 20 times greater. That's our low limit. Our SNR low limit is 20. Okay. okay, great. Next question. Do the sensors need to be pulled on an annual basis for verification? Okay, okay so this is another big one that customers have issues with. Um, the answer to that is no. Now, after the first year of installation, we do recommend that you remove them for the first year, okay? Any drifting effects that's going to occur in the timing of the sensors uh, has been shown to sh happen in the first year. But after that first year, we do not require or recommend that we pull the sensors from the line, okay? Some, some customers have AQMD requirements, local uh, or state requirements that require that, but us as the, as the OEM, we do not require that you remove the sensors. We have several customers that have been, had them in for five, six years and have never pulled the sensors and they work great. The annual verification still does take place. We just do them in situ without removing the sensors from the line. That's very important. So they don't have to bring the line down or do anything no. from that standpoint. Okay. Yeah, we okay. talked a little bit about flares, uh, but SICK also does uh, flow meters for steam and for um, any type of gas measurement. So we're kind of focusing on players today, but we want to make sure that extends out to other applications as well. Okay, great. Next question. Are the SICK flare flow meters rated class one division two by UL or FM? Um, it's by FM class one division two. Um, per, yeah, yeah, FM. Okay, I'm just going back through the list here to make sure I didn't forget anything. Um, okay, one one last question it looks like. Um, we have someone asking if the installation drawings would be available to share. Installation drawings? I'm not... it, it depends on the application. So um, I'm, they have, um, you, you have, typical installation drawings, but then it depends on the size of the line and the application as to where it would be more apt to right. that application. 
and those are normally provided once the oh, order yes. is set. Correct? Absolutely, yeah. Once once the evaluation is done and we've determined what sensor setup is going to be going along with the with the, your specific application, then the drawings will be provided for that specific application. Okay, that answers the question. Yeah, uh, me too. Well, if it did not answer the question, uh, the person that asked that, maybe they can provide a little bit more um, of their question and we can get back to them. Uh, one other question that came up here, uh, do you have a solution to replace GEs without too much pain? So yes, that's this guy right here. This is the EX90 retrofit version that can be installed in the existing nozzles and existing valves don't have to remove them. Uh, all you have to do is remove the sensors that are installed, install ours, uh, they are three inch, 150 pound. Our other designs are two inch, but these are three inch and made specifically to go into those uh, installations. So they can be, and we have plenty of these in stock right now, so there's very minimal lead times that are associated with the EX90 to get these installed. We can usually, if we start in the morning, we're done by lunchtime on swapping these out, including the flow computer and uh, cables. There's uh, the cables, we don't have any coax cable going to the flow computer from the sensors. It's a digital R, uh, uh, RS-485 communications back to the sensors and back to the flow computer from the sensors. So that's very important. So they're out less than a day to have this swapped over to a new technology that can fulfill maybe the requirements that the, the unit that's in there is not fulfilling. Correct. That's fantastic. So I actually, if you guys want, I do have a quick two minute video on that retrofit. We can, we can show if you guys want to. Up to you. Any other questions, Nick? Um, I, I do have a, a, another question here that popped up. Uh, what are the typical lead times for your meters? So I think a lot of that has probably to do with the application. If yes. it's a pretty straightforward application, like you mentioned with the, the change out of a competitive product, those are in, in stock and we could probably get those out in two to three weeks. Um, outside of that, we would have to just take it on a case by case basis exactly if we right. had to do a configuration yeah. change. Depends on when we get the flare evaluations done and, and the lead time from uh, on that particular device, yeah. So it's on a case by case basis. But the nice part about it is SICK is, is, uh, is based out of Houston. All of their engineering, uh, their service, uh, their sales office is right here in Houston on the north side of town. Uh, Vector is on the south side of town. We're opening up a new office in Pearland coming up later this year. Uh, so we are, are, are very poised to, to, uh, to be responsive to the customer locally. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have service throughout the territory. Uh, Vector covers SICK from Texas, New Mexico, Oklahoma, uh, Kansas, uh, and uh, outreaches of that as well. Uh, great support structure from the, the whole team there. Uh, SICK has done a very good job of putting the right people in the right positions, and uh, Vector is very excited to be a partner with them. Okay, great. It looks like we have covered all of our questions. Fantastic. With that, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us. We trust that it was a worthwhile experience for you and that you learned from our experts uh, some valuable takeaways. Have a great rest of the day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Be safe.